Yore. Yes, really good. Yore. Yeah. Yore. Sorry. Yeah. I'll just leave this in of me being a, an American uh, ding dong. Um, <laughs> If you haven't watched it yet, <laughs> you should check out uh, the recording on Sharp 11 Music's channel, links in the description, of uh, an arrangement that uh, I was asked, oh, God, that's a terrible way to get into it. Um, <laughs> so this is the first Pandemonium Big Band interview. I don't know what I'm doing, so bear with me. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've been a big fan of this guy's uh, channel. He does amazing transcriptions he's an incredible woodwind player uh, i think his main axe is alto saxophone but he's really really amazing and uh much more popular than i am on youtube and he reached out to me after seeing a video that i did with the great lorenzo ferrero of a sax soli done on a composed saxophone solo and he was uh he, he asked me if i could uh do a full like super sax take on a Charlie Parker transcription that he had done. And I'm so excited for you guys to hear it. If you haven't heard it yet, you should follow the link in the description and go check out uh, the recording because that went up today. If you're seeing this, then you can also watch that. And so um, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, my new friend, Yore Reinders. <laughs> I, was that I, close? Uh, that was close. Yeah, it was really close. <laughs> that, was, that was good. That was good, really, yes. Hi, nice to be on your your channel. Yeah, I've been, I've been following and I've been watching quite some videos uh, because you know I like big band and then you do stumble onto your channel and uh, there is um, yeah not too much content from YouTubers really devoted to big band, which is a pity because you know if you want to, I think there are many people into uh, into big band actually. I mean there are. I know a lot of people and also not if it doesn't have to be on a professional level also on an amateur level there are definitely a lot of people who love it and uh, yeah there is not enough content uh, Elliot so keep on uh, yeah getting it out there yeah thank you and it, it's been really really interesting to me I mean I I am a Los Angeles native and there's obviously a big band scene here but it, it seems like there's even more interest in, you know, across the ocean. I, I've made a lot of connections with people in Great Britain and other parts of Europe. And I think it's really encouraging to see how well this music is spread. Yeah, we have like, I'm from Belgium. We have here the Brussels Jazz Orchestra. I don't know if you, you've you heard oh, from Oh, they're that. amazing. amazing. They're amazing really a nice, they're more, I mean, even more jazz, jazz oriented, uh, like, uh, and then you have also, and I've been a couple of times to the WDR big band rehearsals, uh, which is amazing. Like the sound they make and it's, it's a experience and they have, of course, like every week they have a crazy new guest. So I've, I've uh, seen Chris Potter play with them from, you know, just a few feet away. Uh, who else? Uh, Randy Brecker I saw. So that's, wow. you know those uh that's just two of the bands but uh somehow um there are the like the wdr band also um big bands connected really to the radio or tv stations which is cool so they get funding and they do cool projects with very nice guests so yeah that's the the, the better bands here and uh for the rest i think there are yeah, there are quite some big bands out, but it's not that it's super popular. Obviously, it's not like if I go to my neighbors that, that yeah. there are no big so bands. So I've been wanting to ask you. So, um, you know, anyone that's watching this has hopefully already seen <laughs> the, uh, the, the video that, we're, that connected us. Um, what made you want to do that solo as a soli harmonized? Yeah, that's a good question. And because that's but, tough. There's a lot of notes. <laughs> yes, but somehow you know, I, I, you know, you know a lot of you, you get to know a lot of Charlie Parker is like, uh, what as a saxophone player into jazz is like the obvious stuff, of course. And you have the the very pop popular uh, Omnibook tunes. But once you dive deeper into Parker from his 
he was 22 when he recorded this Cherokee. Then you see how he came from the Lester Young school and also the setting is so cool. It's a trio, it's with a kind of gypsy guitarist. So it's very basic. There is a drummer who you barely hear. So Charlie Parker plays so composed. I think that's the word. It's it's like if you would compose the perfect bebop solo in three courses. It's so beautiful. I couldn't imagine a better solo. And also what um, for me, what struck me is that there is not too much chromatics in it. If you compare it to his later work, it's pretty diatonic. Yeah. And I hear really it's, it's one big melody. It's composed of so many melodies and I don't know, somehow I imagined a very... It, it would only get more mellow by making it a five-part uh, sax soli, I thought. No, I mean, the, the, result, the result speaks for itself. Um, so, <laughs> as, as I'm sure a lot of people watching this have gone through, I mean, I, I went to university for, to, to do jazz studies, and part of you know, getting my degree, I had to learn a bunch of transcriptions, be able mm -hmm. to reproduce them on trumpet. And that is tough. And, <laughs> and uh, when I was in college, I was transcribing Roy Hargrove and I love Chet Baker and oh, yeah. even Chet Baker, who, whose solos are sparse, mm -hmm. like recreating them on, on your own instrument is a difficult task to do for anyone that hasn't done it. Um, and you are coming in and not only playing the alto part, which is, you know, the original, the, the actual transcription, the lead alto in, in the thing we did is literally the transcription yeah, that you did. Exactly, um, yeah. Plus four lower harmonies that are all much more difficult to play than the original. It's, it's really an amazing feat just to perform it. But like any saxophone player will know that played in a big band and if there is a soli, you, you can better have the, the lead seat. I mean, it has its uh, own challenges. I mean, of course, but... Um, yeah, that wasn't the hardest part. I mean, although it is certainly a also a challenge to, to make it sound well, but um, I would say which was the hardest part probably was the first tenor. Yes, that was the one that had the most crazy. Also, it's really weird to see all those uh, other voices. Like, you know the shapes and you know the rhythm obviously which stays the same it's very beboppy and but they just take turns that you don't expect and it also you know because i recorded it um separately uh if you just solo every part if you solo on the first tenor part it they all all the notes make sense and they are beautiful and somehow it sounds crazy it's That's really wild. weird so that's, um, yeah, I don't know what I want to add to that, but you know, I, I <laughs> probably, uh, I, I really am thinking of putting out, for example, just a video where I'll do that exa exact cover with the band, with the guys that recorded for me, and maybe just single out the tenor solo part, because it's that's just... a great idea. I mean, that could also have been a solo, because they also work, all those notes work perfectly over the changes and somehow you wouldn't look for these kind of lines no i mean <laughs> i i wrote the parts and yeah. i have no idea what the tenor one part would sound like soloed because oh, I, yeah. I honestly wasn't thinking about it that way no um, no obviously it's no. impossible yeah. <laughs> so i mean it's a long so it's three three full choruses yes and he only plays the melody for the first 16 bars or something like that Eight. And eight yeah. bars, it's even less than that. And <laughs> and after that, it's just like eighth notes and triplets. And I mean, it's a beautiful solo, but it's, it is dense with notes. And um, I think my, my score, which is eight bars per page uh, mm -hmm. in this case, ended up being something like 25 pages long. Oh. Um, yeah, it, this, <laughs> this took... So for reference, the, the video that you saw of Lorenzo... I think that was a single chorus of There Will Never Be Another You, like mm -hmm. full of 16th notes. Um, I mean, played much more slowly than this. And uh, I think I, that took me about four hours to do. 
And it wasn't, it, it was partially because there were so many notes, but also partially because his vocabulary is so much different than mine and trying mm -hmm. to justify some of the notes that he chose. I mean, you could hear the line and it's beautiful, but then I have to figure out what the function is in order to harmonize it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I end up trying different things and coming up with what it is. I had to do the same thing with this, except that the, act the actual solo is eight times as long or something like that. <laughs> so I, th I think this literally took three full days or something like that. I mean, wow. it was it was a big project. It was fun though. This was a fun one. Wow, yeah, I can't, I, I almost can't imagine. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm so grateful for that, Elliot. Oh, I'm it grateful was that one you asked of, me to do it. You know, the, like really, this is this has been on my mind for years. Like there are like three musical projects which I have in my mind for, let's say at least five years. And this was one of them. Um, I don't know, I felt really hard or I felt really strong about this working out somehow. And I didn't know why exactly, because, you know, uh, it's not like I have arranged something um, alike. So um, I, can I ask you a question about the arranging? Please. Um, at this point, um, do you have some kind of, <laughs> it's a big word, philosophy to, you know, you have all those kind of different techniques to arrange. I've, I've seen your uh, saxophone, uh, um, how to arrange for a saxophone section video, which is great, by the way. Do you have a kind of template or a philosophy like, no, I see a long note, so let's take rather this technique or something like that? Or you just try and see whatever comes up? I mean, it's sort of a combination. So as a rule of thumb, uh, the faster that the notes are moving, like this doesn't have to do with tempo. So if we're, you know, a quarter note equals 60, but you've got a, a figure that's made of 30 second notes, like they're moving fast. Or mm -hmm. in the case of this Cherokee, if you're just playing eighth notes, like that's really fast. So generally, if it's moving that fast, I'll do unison or octave unison, and that's it. Um, but yeah, for, sure. Yeah. yeah, but for the <laughs> sake of this project, I knew that we wanted that super sax sound, which kind of expands on that. So then I add closed voicing, where we're talking about the first alto and the barry sax are playing an octave unison, and the other three are in the middle. And mm -hmm. that's what I use most of the time. And what I've come to, you know, from years of arranging for big band, I've learned, at least for myself, uh, using a technique, like if I choose to do drop two or I choose to do drop two, drop four, always sounds better than when I just choose to, you know, try spreading it and see how it sounds, right? Yeah. So going with a technique and applying it you know, flawlessly is usually, or not usually, always going to sound better. Like the, the, the section sounds sonorous in the way that you want a sax section to sound. Um, so for me, it's just choosing which voicing technique to use where. Um, in the case of this, it was almost moving too fast to do anything more than closed voicing most of the time. Uh, but I think there were a few spots where I spread it out a little bit more. Like, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember exactly where. It, 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 there are a couple spots where I really wanted the impact of the berry hitting a really low note or something like that. And in those cases, I, I probably did like a drop two with the berry on the root. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly also to come if I'm if I'm, I didn't really analyze it, but if I when I was recording, like at the end of a chorus or something like there, the baritone would kind of conclude with the root or something to absolutely. solidify the line. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also, also, I was wondering this, like the the second tenor appears to have the most tension-ish notes, like or or maybe not even tensions, but if it's the major seven or it's the nine, like that, you know is alongside that third so it's the crunchy part yeah it, it feels like the the second tenor yeah the second the tenor is always going to be playing the harmony that's right above the melody when we're in closed voicing and so a lot of time that that ends up being you know a half step or a second away and really has that yeah. crunch yeah because i i was doing this like i i recorded first the lead and then i did you know the the second alto first tenor and then second tenor but i always would just listen back with lead 
and then the part I was recording. And mm. then with the second right. tenor, it was like, whoa, this is, whoa, <laughs> this is kind of, without the context, this is pretty harsh to listen to. That's you great. Know, that, yeah. And, and one other, other thought that I did have was, if you would go about, like, for example, a trombone section or a trumpet section, would you make different choices there for the voicings and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, yeah, you obviously don't have like a baritone kind of, uh, you know, instrument in the trumpets. But I mean, yeah, I mean, still, I I use I I very <laughs> seldomly write parts that are this busy for brass at all because you know the instruments are so much less dexterous. They yeah. it'll take ten times the amount of practice for them to get it right as it would for a saxophone for a saxophonist. So I don't write stuff like that very often, but let's say we took a, a, a transcribed trumpet solo, like a, like a Chet Baker solo and wanted to harmonize it for or, trumpet section. Yeah. Or do you know the, the one uh, by the GRP big band? The, oh yeah. The what's of it? Clifford Olio. Brown. Olio. No, it's, a, oh. isn't it? Cher it's Cherokee. Oh, Cherokee. Of, yeah. Sorry. By Clifford Brown. I think they do one chorus where it's voiced and stuff. Uh, that's the, that's the one with, um, it's it's like uh, Arturo Sandoval and Randy mm -hmm. Brecker, yeah. and um, who else was in that Byron, section? Byron, Byron Stripling, Stripling. Oh god. And Chuck Finley. Wow, oh, what a section! Yeah. God, no, no slouches among them. So yeah, if you're gonna have a section like that, by all means, do something like that. <laughs> for us mere mortals, um, no. But yeah, if you if I was doing it for trumpet section, the first thing I would I would never go beyond an octave. So. Uh, I actually did a video on this recently, but the reason is uh, trumpet sounds inc sounds very different um, at the top of the staff than it is at the bottom of the staff. And that's kind of unavoidable. It's just a part of the way the instrument works. And so if you have first trumpet like screaming up high and then you want to write a note more than an octave below, like let's say a tenth below, they're not going to be able to match the intensity of the first trumpet. So, okay, but that's yeah. just a, a little... Uh, that's the same a bit with saxophones maybe not as extreme but you know you, you'll you can also hear that in the recording the the, the tenors are more played in a sub tone than the alto parts of course you know, because of in the range they they are and then the baritone there it feel i mean it's lower but it's in a comfortable range so that one is way more high and you get also this mold of of different kind of sound textures um, through the instruments. No, I mean, you're, you're right. Um, I mean, Barry Sax basically exists one octave below alto sax, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, at least in jazz band. And so uh, I guess all the other instruments are kind of used to playing in the middle there. Where was I going with this? I had something smart to say. <laughs> no, I probably didn't. Um, but yeah, if I was doing trumpets, I wouldn't go much more. I wouldn't go more than an octave unless I'm trying to do... I guess they're, they're, if I was writing literally just for trumpets, uh, I guess you could. Like if you want to have one person soaring up there and then a three-person <laughs> section down below or something. But if, if I wanted to just have that 2D sound of them all playing together, I probably would write um, with uh, octave doubled and then two parts in the middle most yeah. of the time if they're up high. It just has this like it... beautiful like fanfare richness to it. But isn't that maybe also because, you know, with trumpets in mind, you, you immediately think of a strong, solid, like what you say, like, like it's almost like a fanfare, like yeah. really, uh, it's big and, and um, almost like you're winning the war or something like this oh, kind yeah. of sound. But you're not as quickly thinking of a mellow trumpet section sound. No, you're right. Maybe. I like, mean, like... Uh like a RH factor or Roy Hargrove kind of like, yeah, like sound. So in that case, I mean, he's using, I think either like trumpets on the top and then a flugel horns down below and he's trying to voice them as close as possible. So mm -hmm. when you're doing that kind of a thing, then you're going to voice all, all of your instruments and it might be even more than four. It could be five. Try like within an octave and you're not worried mm -hmm. about keeping a minor third between the top and the next voice because you're almost trying to make it sound like as dense of a thing as possible. It's just, it's a totally different writing style. Would you ever consider this with a, with a different YouTuber on a different instrument? Would I? I mean, so <laughs> I'll tell you this. 
as a as an arranger who's you know putting himself out on YouTube as an arranger mm -hmm. and you know <laughs> being overtly friendly and laughing at his own bad jokes and stuff like that. I actually I, I think I'm 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 kind of approachable and I, I get a lot of emails from people asking me to do projects and I usually don't have time for them. Sure. Or, you know, it feels like it might be too ambitious or I don't exactly know why I would want to do it. Um, and when you, I mean, you wrote, <laughs> you wrote me this huge, very nice email and I was already familiar with your channel from just watching it myself. And, um, but you know, I, I wasn't aware how good of a, how great of a musician you were. And you actually sent me playing examples. Like, I want you to do this really ambitious thing. By the way, I will be able to pull it off when you write it, <laughs> which is a good point. Cause I didn't want to spend, you know, that amount of time so that it would never get recorded or get recorded in a way that I wouldn't want to share with people. Um, like that's one of the reasons why I, you know, spent all that time with Lorenzo because I knew he was a virtuoso and would be able to knock it out. That, that, that's a good basic point. Uh, why do you determine if you should do a project? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually, maybe I shouldn't say it, but 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 it's okay. I'll I'll try to take it. I I play in a working uh, professional big band here. Um, nice. That consists on I live like really close uh, to the in Belgium, but really close to the border with Netherlands and Germany. So it's kind of a um, international big band. And, and we did quite some gigging before the pandemic, obviously. I don't know if, and we did like every month, a kind of open rehearsal at a very nice place. So we wouldn't stop, but we would side treat and there was an audience and that, that was a really wow. nice thing, you know, uh, that was going on. So I want to, ask you know the the conductor of that band if we could try the sax solely maybe live once that'd uh, be amazing i'd love to hear yeah that. i don't know if the guys will will be that happy with me but they they should be able to do it but they will need obviously to spend some time as yeah. especially the, the the first tenor part yeah i mean i think that i think that because the the solo, because, because of Bird's solo, because it, it's so strong melodically, mm -hmm. I think it would work and be musical slowed down a little bit too. Oh yeah. So you, know, <laughs> you don't true. have to do it up to speed for, no, uh, no, no. for that kind of performance either. But it's, it's, by the way, when I was recording it and I was kind of, you know, putting, I, I use Ableton, so trying to make oh, a, yeah. a template out of it also with a click track because the other guys were recording. so. I needed to do it on click, otherwise remotely yeah. it was impossible. But oh, of course, it was so weird to see how close they stayed to their original tempo. I, I barely needed to. I, I did some slight corrections, but sometimes even after sixteen bars, which is amazing that these guys were so so well in on the same tempo uh, on this two fifty. It is guys, if you want to. If you want to study it, studying it on 250 BPM. But why it doesn't feel also that that was that's always why I I also love this solo. It's bebop, but it doesn't feel like bebop because we have this gypsy guitar player playing his bass notes in two, actually all the time. Mm -hmm. So it feels really easy going. My my wife who doesn't like bebop. You know, and I, I put this solo a couple of times on and she said, she said, who's that? And I said, like, it's Charlie Parker. Oh, is that also Charlie Parker? It, it doesn't feel <laughs> that, you know, annoying. <laughs> it doesn't have all the pretension of typical Charlie. I'm just, <laughs> and, I don't think of Charlie Parker in that way. That's funny. But yeah, but if, if you would have, you know, like this typical walking bass and like, um, you know, yeah, playing swing in the, the walking bass way, it would feel way more agitated and way more, a little bit, yeah, nervous. Or, yeah, just change the character. Yes, completely, completely from a rather relatively relaxed thing to a very uh, animated. Uh, yeah, it kind of gives, it's interesting because the bass is playing in two, it makes Charlie Parker's figures feel like they're in double time, even though they're really just in... In single time yeah uh, we did you know with uh with the guys recording on bass drums on drums is my brother by the way that's gary oh wow um, 
and then we had Raw Buch, I really love for it. He has a huge sound. He was also a engineer, so he all a studio engineer, so he knows the bass and he makes it sound like really big. And then with Timothy, also from the channel, you know, we used actually as acoustic guitar, you asked me, and, and it sounds really, really nice. But they they kind of stayed true to the original, which I asked, but also put a little bit of their own. Uh, so we start walking in the third chorus, which they don't oh, beautiful. in the, but, but it just builds. So first it's in two feel and then second chorus it's two feel but he plays quarter notes uh, but doubles the same note so you get a mix of a walking bass and so I love that how it develops a bit to the end the guys did really a great job there that's a that's a great decision Yore sorry Say, well, give me give it to me one more time I'm sorry the name my name or what yeah, yeah Yore Yore yes really good Yore yeah Yore sorry I'll just leave this in of me being an American uh, ding dong. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this project to do and, you know, executing it so amazingly and, um, you know, helping share it on YouTube. I hope that people really enjoy it. Uh, it was it, it was a real pleasure. So thanks for joining me. Oh no, the the pleasure is mine. I, I'm I'm so grateful that you did this and this. Yeah, this was both a little bit excruciating for recording all the parts. No, it was actually fun, but it was really challenging. But what's good, I I really need to schedule out. You know, <laughs> it's five parts, so one week of five days of practicing and then one day of recording for <laughs> five weeks. That was you know that was how I needed to, so it was kind of longer, but it was so, so fulfilling. That's the right word for this project. And I, I don't think I've ever thought of that particular word when I was recording for anything. So this, this is just really, um, I think a great, I hope a great addition to, to all the super sacks, um, things that are out there. And uh, I, I hope people will, you know, do this maybe two more and it doesn't have to be a partner solo obviously but it's so much fun to to create more texture and context to a melody you already love so I, i'm so grateful for you helping me with that one particular solo i i really loved to to have yeah it's not anymore in the past tense i i love <laughs> to have it now and and uh, yeah, thank you for yes. that, Elliot. So great. Thank you. So I look forward to our next project. Yeah. Until then. Bye. <laughs> yeah.